Yo, yo, what's going on, y'all? It's your boy Devon Toro, and welcome to another Help Me Devon tutorial. And today, in this Help Me Devon tutorial, I'll be showing you guys three game-changing tips for a low end that I've been using a lot as of recently and I think could be really effective in your mixes. Okay, so first and foremost, what we're gonna do is let me play you some drums and bass together to give you an idea of the song we are gonna be working with today so you can hear that relationship between the bass and the kick and just the low end in general. Check this out. So you can hear the bass, you can hear the low end, it's tight, it's punchy, uh, the bass isn't too overbearing, the song didn't call for that really, really hard, loud, 808 uh, kind of bass sound, but you can hear the relationship between that kick and that bass, and it, they're living together. The kick sounds really punchy, the bass is intelligible, I can clearly hear it, hear it. I'm pretty sure even on smaller cell phones you can hear that bass cutting through nice and clean, and there's a good relationship between the two. I'm going to show you the three tips that I use to accomplish this kind of effect and this kind of sound and cohesion uh, when it comes to my low end. Now, before we go any further, I'm gonna ask you guys to comment, like, and subscribe. It would really help this channel a lot. Let's move on with the tutorial. Okay, so tip number one is going to be something that I actually learned from Jason Joshua and Dave Pensado, two of my heroes. Long story short, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something called what they refer to as molting the bass. Now, when they say molten the bass, let me just explain it this way. Basically, we're going to take a duplicate of our bass track. So basically, you've got one bass track here, one ba bass track here, same exact things. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna roll off the top end of one, and we're gonna roll off the bottom end of the other, allowing us to affect the low end of the bass differently from how we affect the high end. Just keep that in your mind, don't get lost, and just keep that in mind. Let me show you inside the DAW. Okay, so let me take a few of my bells and whistles off. And now what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to show you what I mean as far as separating the bass. So basically you see here I have low bass and high bass. These are the same exact basses, only I rolled off the high end on one and rolled off the low end on the other, around that 300 hertz range to be specific. Now, let's listen to the top end of the bass. This is the top end of the bass. Cool, that's the top end. Now let's listen to the bottom end. Cool, so we have separated our bass. There is the low end of the bass and now there's the high end of the bass. Why is this powerful? Why does this give you more control? Why is this going to be an incredible uh, thing to try in your mixes? See it like this. Think about a compressor. When a compressor is attenuating a signal, basically you're getting it triggering uh, what has the most energy. And guess what tends to have most of the energy when it comes to just a mix in general or just from looking at a frequency spectrum is concerned. You're gonna get a lot of that low end triggering that bass sound. So it's basically going to just be trying to pull back on that low end stuff as opposed to really not even bothering with that top end stuff as much or better yet, the top end isn't really triggering that compressor as much. Now, if I separate the two, and one compressor is focusing strictly on the low end, and then I got another compressor strictly focusing on the top end of the stuff, now maybe I can get some more nuances out of that top end of the bass that can be intelligible uh, through smaller speakers and things of that nature, while maintaining the dynamics and getting some more strength as well as control over the low end. I hope that that makes sense to you because that in itself just changed my entire, uh, uh, just, ideology and, and perspective in the way I went about doing this. So I needed to explain that to kind of get you to understand uh, why they did that. And uh, it's an amazing trick and I really kudos to them for doing this. Now, I'm gonna show you in depth what I do to affect it. Okay, so now that I explained how I separated it, this is the first thing we're gonna do. The very first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to play with the stereo field of the actual bass sounds. Now, 
simply said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mono the lower stuff or the lower base, and I'm going to widen the higher base. This is gonna give me a bigger bass sound without having the issue or problem of widening and trying to uh, make the lower sounding frequencies push to the sides. I'd rather that stuff be more centered because it's gonna give me more punch and it's gonna give me some more headroom and a lot more control and it doesn't feel as messy. Now granted, that doesn't work for everyone. I'm just saying as far as what I was trying to accomplish by doing this. So I'm gonna mono the lower stuff and I'm gonna widen the higher uh, bass uh, uh, in that particular way. So right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how I monoed the bass. So basically this is what I did. I opened up any imager should suffice, one of your favorite images. One in particular is the ozone imager. I love this imager so much. And I'm going to A, B, uh, before and after of me monoing uh, this actual bass. Check this out, without first. So the difference is very subtle, but if you're listening closely on headphones or on your studio monitors, you'll notice that the low end felt more centered and punchy. You felt like it wasn't as loose and kind of, not washed, but it kind of lacked uh, focus when it was not monoed. And that's why I like to mono my bass uh, as far as that low end is concerned. Now granted, this doesn't work for every single sound. This is just an example as far as what I was trying to accomplish for this one. But monoing that bass really helped me to get that bass centered and focused in the middle, making it give me a sense of just more punch from the actual low end. That's what I did there. So literally just went I'll show you my settings. Basically, all I did was went to this tab right here and just brought this down some, which helped me to mono it uh, a lot more. So basically, if I had it up this way, cranked up, that would be widening the stereo image. And when you put it down this way, that is me monoing the actual image. So that's what I did there. Now, you can guess what I probably did on the high end of the bass, as far as that's concerned. All I did was, went to the top section of the bass, which is around that 700 hertz range, which sometimes this doesn't work, and please be careful of your phase. This is important, I won't get too deep in that, but use your ears and determine where you want to create the widening. It should be further up the spectrum. And what I did was, I went over here, and I widened this section right here, as you can see. So, let me take it off, and I'll bypass it back and forth so you can get an idea of what it sounds like before and after. So without first. So what you notice, once again, is somewhat subtle. It feels like the bass kind of opened up just a little bit. Now granted, again, check your phase, be very careful not to overdo this because you could be causing some phase cancellations, some phase issues in your mix. But make sure you're listening and, be, and just be wary of that in the background. Nonetheless, you notice that the bass sound, as far as the high end bass, kind of opened up a bit and felt like it pushed a little bit more to the side. And that is what we did, creating more of a stereo sounding bass by monoing the low end and then widening the high end, making it feel a little bit more wide in, in general and punchy as well. So let's take a listen to what that actually sounds like now as far as that bass sound is concerned. Check this out. So you notice you, you feel the focus of that low end up the middle. You feel it, and you can feel like, oh, I still feel some width on the sides. Really powerful trick. Uh, I love that one to death. Okay, let's move on to the next and last trick. And basically, this trick is adding compression and saturation. 
And basically what I'm gonna do is, obviously I'm affecting the low different from the high, but this is what we're gonna do by adding compression and saturation. With the compression, we're gonna get some more level and some more balance and control over the dynamics. With the saturation, we're just gonna add some harmonics into both of those different signals in order to give us one, more perception of volume, two, more of that um, just impact and feeling. You'll see exactly what I mean. Let's do it. So let's add some compression to the low end first. So first and foremost, you see that I added uh, one compressor here and the compressor that I used for the low end was an CLA 2A. Now I don't see a lot of people use the CLA 2A for compression on low end, but I love it so much. It adds this thickness to the actual sound uh, that I really, really enjoy. Okay, so let's listen to a before and after of the bass uh, as far as being affected by the 2A. So this is without first. That gains so much just meat and just body and grit. And that was just us using this one compressor that is really just adding some, some weight and some energy um, into the low end, but still controlling it at the same time. So you saw myself getting about three dB of compression, three to five at most of actual compression. And I wasn't losing low end so much. I know that sometimes when you add compression, you lose some of that low end. But in this particular case, it gave me so much body that I enjoyed the sound of it. So that was my compression for it for the most part. Okay, now on the other side, let's look at the high end of the bass, which is this right here. And let's look at what I did for the compressor here. So this is what I did for the compressor here, for the high end. So you noticed a few things. Of course, you noticed the increase in volume, but what you really, really noticed is you felt like that transient, meaning that initial hit, feels a lot stronger. I feel like I'm getting more of that punch and that transient from the top of the bass, as well as compressing it to get some more of the nuance of it and making it just a little bit more controlled and a little bit more heard in the mix. Now, this particular frequency range that I've compressed as far as the high end of the bass is going to give me a lot more perception of being heard on smaller speakers, on cell phones, on laptops, and things of that nature. It would have been much harder to achieve this by doing it if it was both of them, the low and the high together, because obviously the low would probably be triggered triggering so much of the energy of the compressor for me to try to get up the top one. Don't get confused. You saw what I just did. I compressed the top end differently from how I compress the low end. The top end, I wanted more of that transient to shine through as well as picking up some of those nuances in the signal. Cool. Continue right along. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the saturation that I added. And the beautiful thing about the saturation that I added was I used two really fairly simple plugins for this. One is a classic, one of my favorites. I use R bass to give me some harmonics into my bass signal. Now I went to this 89 Hertz range right here and a little cheat code that I usually do to find where I kind of put the R bass and to some, to my keyboard warriors out there, I'm not saying that this is the way you gotta do it or that there is, you know, this is how you have to do it, but this is just my way of kind of getting a ballpark of where to place the frequency uh, for the R bass to add some harmonic saturation. So what I like to do is I like to come on over to an analyzer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and see where the fundamental frequency, uh, fundamental frequency the fundamental frequency of the actual bass is. So as I hover, I'm looking at the peaks of the analyzer as far as what jumps the highest. So you can obviously see the intervals. This is the first, first interval here, second interval, third interval. 
and I'm basically picking the interval, which is the second interval that feels uh, that is around that 100 hertz range because I know that's that range that's really going to give me the intelligibility on that bass. So I want to add some harmonics to that particular range, but within its interval uh, as far as the harmonics are concerned of the actual sound. Don't get too confused. Just know that. Open the analyzer. Maybe look for the second uh, peak that you see and then decide to punch that number, which I saw was 89, right into the R bass. Now, like I said, for my keyboard warriors, that is not, I'm not saying that this is the way you have to do it, but this is just a technique that I've been using for a long time that has served me very well. Continuing. Okay, so after I've decided where I want to add that saturation into and stuff, I am going to bypass this back and forth and I want you to hear what it sounds like without and with. Remember, I took this intensity knob and I cranked it up just a little bit, about negative 14, to get the sound I have. So, without first. Solo this. Here we go. So it just gave me a little bit more grit, a little bit more body, a little bit more weight, and it did it without really disrupting the sonics of the sound so much. So that was a really powerful trick that I like to use to kind of give me just some sort of saturation, just to give me a little bit more while maintaining it uh, with its harmonic intervals that it's already there. All right. The next piece of saturation that I did was this, and I don't see a lot of people using this, but man, has this changed me forever. Long story short, what I'm gonna do is I added this exciter plugin from Ozone, and what I did was I wind up coming on over here to the 275 hertz range and below, and I put on the warm setting and cranked it to about a 7.2. Now, I want you to hear this before and after. It adds such a interesting tone uh, um, and filling sound to the low end that I really, really enjoy to kind of warm it up. So. Without first, I'll bypass it back and forth. It just gives it a little bit more and I enjoy it so much and it feels uh, a lot quote unquote, warmer in the sense of what the actual uh, emulation is doing for the harmonics and stuff like that with this particular setting. And that's really my setting. Now, before you get out of here, there may be one other trick that I do want to show you just as a little bit of sprinkle on top where I was having a little bit of an issue with the relationship between the kick and the bass. This is a quick little tip. Had a small issue between the kick and the bass. And what I was noticing was as I was playing both of them, I was losing a little bit of impact of the kick as the bass was playing with all of the um, bells and whistles that I put on. So this is what I did. I came on over to here in the bass. And I got rid of some of that 36 hertz range, which I found was actually impacting my kick. So check this out. I like to use this collision feature in FabFilter, which I'll put a card right here to that particular tutorial to show you this amazing feature to find out where frequencies are kind of colliding and where you may be getting some masking and things of that nature. So basically this is what I did. Check out this signal. So you can see that this red is getting highlighted and that's basically telling me where there may be some frequency masking or where basically frequencies are colliding between my kick and my actual uh, bass. Now, like I said, I'll show you tutorials as far as how to set that up and how to know how everything works, but for now, I'll just show you this really quick. Now, with that being said, I'll bypass this back and forth. So obviously I saw the red spike as far as the red highlight and I pulled some of that down out of my base in order to make some room for the kick. I also wanna say, this does not work all the time. This is not something you always have to do as far as going to the good old 60 hertz trick and pulling some out of the base to make room for the um, kick. You don't have to always do that. That doesn't always work. Uh, that's something that we've been doing as engineers for years, but it's not, you don't have to always do that. Just know that and keep that in mind. Sometimes it just sounds good. In this particular case, it was interfering with my kick impact. Watch. Okay, so I'm gonna bypass this cut 
back and forth. Listen to the impact of the kick without first. a huge difference as far as just taking out about 3 dB of that particular range. It was around a 37 hertz range that was kind of interfering and colliding with the kick. And I was a actually able to go to uh, the actual EQ and boost up the bass just a little bit now that I had more room between them. So it's a really cool trick. That's just the last little tidbit I want to give you just to kind of help in that relationship. So I really hope that that was helpful. I think that you may have a better idea or some more tips and tricks that you can decide which one you want to use or if you even want to use it at all to kind of add to your arsenal of tricks to fix or just make better relationships with your low end. So I'm going to ask you guys to comment, like, and subscribe. Also, you make sure you follow us at Help Me Devon on Instagram. Also, you can go on over to helpmedevon.com and grab that HMD Rosetta EQ, which is made from us. It would really help us so much. Also, make sure you listen to my Audio Nerds podcast. We drop every single Wednesday on this channel, as well as making sure you join our Discord community with a bunch of aspiring engineers like yourself. I really hope that was helpful, and until next time, you guys.